Hello and welcome to today's video. Today is part two of a two-part series regarding the D.B. Cooper hijacking that took place on November 24th, 1971. In the first video, we discussed the first segment of the flight when it departed SeaTac Airport here, joined the Victor 23 Airway. Now, we flew that out of Tacoma Narrows Airport here, intercepted the Victor 23 Airway, and we flew that down here to Toledo Airport so we departed the Victor 23 Airway there, and the reason for that is we conducted an interview of John Rowe, who works at Toledo Airport, and he was an eyewitness of events that took place at SeaTac Airport. The airplane was hijacked in Portland, Oregon, and when it landed at SeaTac, the man identifying himself as Dan Cooper exchanged 36 passengers for parachutes and $200,000 in $20 bills. In today's video, we depart Toledo Airport, rejoin the Victor 23 Airway, and fly that southbound down to the Battleground VOR, and then continue on across the Columbia River at Portland International Airport. Uh, but, but we're going to focus on three different things, one of which is where the FBI focused its search at this place here named Ariel, Washington. Now, a couple of things I would point out is, number one, you can see this is very inhospitable terrain. You have a 2,955 foot elevation here, 2720. You have a river coming through here like this into Lake Merwin. Uh, so this is not a place that an experienced skydiver or paratrooper would want to jump, particularly at night, because this area is going to be completely pitch black. It would be foolhardy to jump out of the back of an airplane here, as is pointed out in Dan Grider's uh, very excellent video. I would also point out this. So if we take a look at the distance from Ariel, Washington to the Victor 23 Airway, you can see that it's 3.2 nautical miles. You would have to deviate from the Victor 23 Airway, which is right here, 3.2 nautical miles to Ariel, Washington. That is a significant deviation from an airway with an airplane that's navigating based on ground-based radio navigation aids, more specifically the battleground VOR, which is located right here. Now, if you look at the distance between where they think that the airplane deviated from Victor 23 here at Ariel to the battleground VOR, that distance right there is only about 11 nautical miles, which is nothing when using a VOR. In fact, when I flew this, I used the VOR on board my airplane, which is the same instrument that would, would have been used uh, back then in 1971. Uh, I don't think I deviated more than 100 feet, if even that, from the Victor 23 airway. So I, I find it hard to believe that the airplane would have deviated that much. And uh, I'm not entirely clear on why the FBI believed he jumped out of there uh, at Ariel, but they were definitely focusing on the wrong area. We're going to continue our flight uh, coming down on, again, the Victor 23 airway. And this is what used to be the Portland VOR right here, right there, which is now known as the Battleground VOR, which is where the airplane would have made a slight right turnout, again, to continue to follow the Victor 23 airway in this direction. Now, this is where Dan Greider uh, points out that he believes uh, D.B. Cooper jumped out of the airplane for several reasons, one of which is that this is a um, populated area back in 1971, significantly less so, but nonetheless, it is a suburban area. It would have been well lit. The weather in Portland was significantly better than uh, it was in Seattle upon departure. The eyewitness that I interviewed indicated that there was uh, rain coming through with wind gusts up in Seattle at the time of departure. But the pilot down here in Portland in the interview with Dan Greider indicated that the clouds were broken. He could see lights and uh, it wasn't significantly windy. So this would have been a far better location to jump out of the airplane. And the other thing that uh, Dan Greider points out is that his wife was a ground support for him. So she would have had to been in an area where he could make contact with her. And uh, so that's where he focused his likely jump site. Uh, again, Dan Greider's video. And the other thing is that he asked for $200,000 in $20 bills. That's a significant amount of currency, and it was given to him in a bag that wasn't very easy to secure on his person. 
And so uh, Dan Greider demonstrates in his skydive jump over the Columbia River here that he couldn't hold on to that money in order to get into an arch and slow his uh, free fall. He was unable to hold the money, went into the Columbia River. Now, so we're going to fly over this jump site. You're going to see that. And the other thing we're going to do after I flew over this, the airspace here at uh, Portland, I turned the airplane around and went up the Columbia River. And what I focused on there was this is where the money was found along the Tina Bar in 1980. 290 of the original $10,020 bills was found at this location. And uh, Dan Greider points out in this video the the way that this river flows. Of course, that's that's the that's downriver right here from the from the likely jump site. So any debris that falls into the water at that location is going to come downriver. And then he points out uh, upon his interview with an individual who operates a sand company here along Tina Bar that a lot of debris based on the way the river flows washes up here at Tina Bar. And so it's no surprise that anything that would have fallen in the water down there at the jump site would have made its way down river to this location and found itself on the shore at the Tina Bar. So we're going to overfly that. And then lastly, we're going to fly up here to the what the FBI believe was the likely jump site up at Ariel and uh, give you a sense of the inhospitable terrain at this location. And uh, again, I'm not certain why the FBI focused its efforts there in Ariel, but they came up empty, and I think they were looking in the wrong place. So that's what we're going to do uh, on today's video. I hope you enjoy it. Toledo traffic, Cherokee 7428 Romeo taking off runway 6, right crosswind departure to the south, Toledo. Engine instruments in the green power is available for takeoff. Airspin is live. And we're in the air. Okay, we're going to join back up with the Victor Airway, Victor 23, and continue that southbound over the Battleground BOR, across the Columbia River, and over at Portland International Airspace, and then we're going to turn the airplane around and come back northbound and fly over the location where the money was found at Tina Bar on the Columbia River, and then overfly Ariel, Washington, the location where the FBI focused the energy of its search with the belief that that's where he jumped out of the airplane. My rate of climb is looking great. We're climbing right now at uh, about 1,500 feet per minute. Nice low density altitude, good day to be flying. Air is calm, coming up on 2,000. And we're looking for 6,500. Okay, we're back on our second leg of Victor 23. And we'll be on heading 155. Coming up out of 3000, we're going to lean the mixture here a little bit. Lake of Rigo traffic. 80 auto helicopter above Lake of Rigo heading southwest. What a beautiful view. Uh, Mount St. Helens, crystal clear. Mount Adams behind that there to the left. Behind us, behind the left wing there, Mount Rainier. What a gorgeous day. Nice calm air, nice cool air. Outside air temperature right now is 20 degrees Fahrenheit at our present location at 4,200 feet. Okay, everything is looking good. Engine instruments are in the green. Rate of climb is, is still great at 90 miles an hour. We're doing about 800 feet per minute. Coming up on 4,500. And coming up on 5,000. Gonna lean the mixture here just a little bit.
There's 5,500, 1,000 to go. Six thousand. Looking out over the left wing there, Mount St. Helens, with a crystal clear view. Beautiful day. Okay, right, we're gonna level off here. And there's Kelso and the Columbia River, so when we return, we're going to come back up to Columbia and uh, overfly uh, Tina Bar, where the money was found by a boy who was digging along the banks of the river. Was found at that location in 1980. And Dan Greider, I believe, rightly surmises that that money was actually dropped where Victor 23 crosses the Columbia River and then that is the flow of the river. And so it washed up, or at least part of it washed up there on Tina Bar, the rest of it, who knows what happened to it, but those that was clearly money from the hijacking because all the serial numbers were recorded. All the terrain you see below us is exactly the terrain that was underneath the airplane. Now the FBI's theory was that the 727 deviated from the Victor 23 airway a fairly substantial amount to put it over Ariel, but uh, I do not believe that's the case. They were using radio navigation equipment, the same thing I have right now tuned in to uh, both VOR1 and VOR2, and uh, I'm tracking that radial inbound, and even with a slight error, that's not gonna take us much more than even a one nautical mile off course, and even that would be a lot because we're getting closer to the station. So I definitely do not buy into that theory. In case we got a little bit of a tailwind, looks like we were uh, doing 138 miles per hour over ground right now. And we're 1.6 nautical miles now northwest of a Kuga intersection. As an experienced skydiver, no one in their right mind would jump out, particularly at night, into this terrain. It makes far more sense, according to Dan Greider's theory, that he would have jumped closer to Portland, just north of the, of the Columbia River there, where it crosses, where Victor 23 crosses at Vancouver. Now the reason I'm not flying this at the altitude that was flown by the 727 on the day in question is that I have a 4K wide angle camera underneath the left wing. And if I were at say 10,500 feet of VFR uh, cruise altitude, because it's a wide angle, it would really be closer to what you would see if you were at 20,000 feet in a normal field of view. So I'm gonna keep it at 6,500 and that wing camera is gonna show about what it would have looked like from 10,000 feet. And it's gonna show a very wide swath of terrain underneath us. Again, as you can see, we're over mountain range here and it's all wilderness. There's really no safe place to land as a skydiver if you were to jump out of the airplane anywhere near here. Now here in a few minutes, we're gonna be coming up on the Roark intersection, Roark intersection, that's 7.5 nautical miles. Just to the left of that, and I'll point it out as we go over it, you're gonna see where the FBI believes uh, 
the DB Cooper jumped out of the airplane. And again, no one in their right mind is going to jump out of an airplane at night over that rural terrain. You wouldn't be able to see anything. You'd be landing in the trees. So that to our left is Lake Merwin. And there's a river that comes off Lake Merwin and feeds into the Columbia River. And the FBI's theory was that along that river, which is the Lewis River, uh, somewhere along there, D.B. Cooper landed, they theorize, he died, and his money ended up going into that river, the Lewis River that flows off Lake Merwin down to the Columbia. That's their theory. I really don't buy it. If you watch Dan Grider's video, I think he's spot on. This is not a place where an experienced uh, paratrooper would jump out of an airplane at night. No way, no how. I'm alternating between uh, VFR sectional and low altitude IFR chart uh, because I want to see the terrain that's below us so they can appropriately point out where they believe uh, DB Cooper went down and they set up their their command center down there and for many days they were combing the area but I think they were they were way off base that's about 26 miles north of where Dan Grider believes he jumped and I also agree with him this is not a hospitable place to jump at night visibility uh, again according to the pilot that actually flew the airplane was actually pretty good down at, in Portland. He said he could see the lights down below. There were some scattered clouds. Winds were about 15 knots out of the south. Good jump conditions. I'm not a, uh, a skydiver, but Dan Greider is, and I certainly trust his judgment. He's not the only one that has that opinion. Okay, so there below us, that's Ariel. That's the area where the FBI focused its search. And on our return flight, I'm gonna try to go a little bit closer over the town itself. That's assuming I still have battery life because I'm not planning on landing now. I'm gonna bring the airplane over the Portland International Airspace there, continue on Victor 23 where it makes a dog leg to the left, to the right rather, after the battleground BOR. So as soon as we Across the battleground VOR, we're going to make that dogleg right, overfly the Portland International airspace, and uh, after we clear their airspace, we're going to begin descending, overfly Vancouver Lake, and then head northbound. All right, so the next waypoint is the battleground VOR, and if you watch Dan Greider's video, he actually uh, did a documentary many years ago and he, he filmed himself there right at the Battleground VOR. So we're going to be overflying that and hopefully you'll be able to pinpoint that below the airplane. I don't see why we can't make a couple of ham radio contacts here. Hello CQ, CQ, CQ 2 meters, Whiskey 7. Norway Yankee Aeronautical Mobile is a Piper Cherokee 6,500 feet southeast bound, uh, just coming up on Battleground Washington Station. Yeah, November Lima 7, Golf Whiskey, uh, Oregon City. You're coming in 20 over S9 here. Okay, November Lima 7, question mark on the suffix W7NY Air Mobile Piper Cherokee. Name here is Bill Bravo, India Lima Lima. Yeah, Bill, uh, the name here is Kurt, Kilo Uniform Romeo Tango, and you are 40 over S9 into uh, Oregon City, so nice signal. Yeah, say again your full call, November Lima 7, question mark, W7NY. Oh, okay, the uh, call here is uh, November Lima 7, Golf Whiskey, Golf Whiskey, over. Okay, roger, roger, November Lima 7, Golf Whiskey, Whiskey 7, Norway, Yankee. Uh, we are currently uh, 6,500 feet and uh, 5.6 nautical miles northwest of the Battleground VOR. We're going to be overflying Portland International Airspace. This flight is a documentary flight on the DB Cooper hijacking that took place 
1971. We're overflying the exact terrain that the 727 flew on that day, which is the Victor 23 airway. Everything's being filmed as we fly with an underwing 4K camera and a POV camera mounted on me in the cockpit. So uh, I'd be happy to send a link of the documentary once it's uploaded to YouTube, provided that your email is good in QRZ. Back to you, NL7GWW7NY, Air Mobile. Yeah, sounds great. Yeah, I remember when they uh, found uh, some of the cash that was from that flight uh, a number of years later. So uh, how's the uh, up there? You're fairly low. Yeah, we're 6,500. Uh, the actual flight was at 10,000. The reason for that is I've got a, a 4K wide-angle camera under the wing. And 6,500 feet, the, the perspective from, from 6,500 with a 4K wide-angle is the same as a normal uh, angle view from 10,000. So we're going to continue the flight at this altitude. Back to you. NL7 GW, good luck on that uh, flight. Yeah, thanks much. And uh, again, if your email's good, we'll send you a link to the uh, documentary on YouTube when it's uploaded. 73s, we'll see you later. NL7 GW, this is W7NY Air Mobile. And for any other station. Alpha, Alpha Zero, Papa Bravo. Yep, gotcha. Alpha, Alpha Zero, Papa Bravo. Just writing some stuff down here. This is Whiskey 7, November Yankee. Piper Cherokee. Uh, southeast bound, 6,500 feet, 129 miles per hour over ground. And uh, we're just coming up on the battleground VOR. We're going to make a slight right turnout and fly over the Portland International Airspace. And we are retracing the Victor 23 airway that was flown during the DB Cooper flight uh, when the, uh, air, the 727 was hijacked. We're going to overfly the Columbia River, where we believe uh, he jumped out the, the back uh, stairway of that airplane. We're commemorating that, and uh, we're again making a documentary. I'll ha be happy to send you the link when that is completed, as long as your email is good. In QRZ, back to UAA zero, Papa Bravo, Whiskey Seven, Norway Yankee, Air Mobile. And I see you uh, just starting to make a little bit of a left. Uh, uh, that'd be the right turn, uh, heading towards Vancouver. But uh, cool. Well, uh, well, I think that's you. I have to look at it again but uh yeah uh whiskey seven november yankee uh william uh i've just looked you up on the qrz i'm going to make sure my my email is correct on qrz i'd be very interested in that um in that link also um the uh you just missed a f8 or uh, ea18 um on uh, Simplex, uh, heading east, uh, right basically where you were, <laughs> just uh, 10 minutes ago. The tail number of the airplane, if you want to track it on FlightAware uh, or Flight Radar 24, is November 7428 Romeo, November 7428 Romeo. Hey, you can track it that way. AA0, Papa Bravo, have it in my air mobile. Okay, perfect. Yep, I, uh, that's who I clicked on, thinking it was you. Uh, by what you were saying, but uh, okay, have uh, have a good flight, and uh, I'd be interested in that uh, in that link. Uh, it's always uh, interesting. Alpha Alpha Zero Papa Bravo, time to go walk the dog. Okay, very good. A A Zero PB Seven MY. You have a great signal into the airplane, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. Uh, S Nine Plus armchair copy, great audio. Hopefully, I'm doing the same down your way. Uh, Seventy three to you. Thanks for reaching out into the airplane today. AA0 Papa Bravo, W7NY Air Mobile 73, see you later. Yep, oh yeah, you're, you're full quieting and uh, very good signal, but uh, not too far from you, especially at that altitude. <laughs> All right, have a good flight. AA0 Papa Bravo. Okay, we are just now coming up on, we're just going to be overflying the Vancouver Pearson Field Airport. Yeah, you should be able to see it down there below the airplane, just off the right side, just off at about 2 o'clock. And uh, this is where Dan Greider believes, just as we come up onto the Columbia River, he believes that, that that's where he jumped out the back of the 727, and that his wife, Karen, who uh, was uh, part of his support team, met him at some point on the ground, uh, a phone or some means of communication with his wife who was on the ground, so that she could rendezvous with him and transport him out of the area.
And uh, we're gonna be crossing the river here soon. And when Dan Greider did his jump, he jumped out right over the Columbia River and tried to hold on to that bag of simulated cash. He had the equivalent amount of paper uh, that was carried by D.B. Cooper at the time that he jumped. And he tried to hold on to that, and that was simply not possible. Uh, because it wasn't properly secured to his body, and he had to go into an arch to slow his descent rate. And so, uh, Dan rightly surmises that he lost that money, and it went into the Columbia, and washed uh, downriver at Tina Bar. And we'll hopefully be overflying that here pretty soon. We are directly over now. We're above the Portland International Airspace. And uh, we're flying directly over that right now. And as soon as we clear that airspace, we're going to begin a descent. And then come back around and fly north over the Tina Bar, uh, the location I just mentioned. And then hopefully we have enough battery life to fly directly over Ariel, Washington, where the FBI set up its command post. That there down below us, right off the nose of the airplane, is the Willamette River. The confluence of that river where it meets the Columbia is just behind the right wing there. If you could see it on the POV camera, that's the Columbia and that's where the Willamette River meets it. Now the 727 uh, that flew this route actually continued on Victor 23 and then on to Reno, Nevada and landed there. That was their flight plan and he continued with that plan and made a, land, a safe landing in Reno. Less one passenger, a.k.a. D.B. Cooper. Okay, we're going to join up with the Columbia River here and then follow that upriver to the Tana Bar. Okay, 1,000 feet right now over the Columbia River. And I'll let you know when we're coming up on uh, Tina Bar. That to the right is Vancouver Lake. That's Mount Hood, just behind Vancouver Lake off the right wing there. Right there is Mount Adams, right at about uh, 2 o'clock, at about 1 o'clock Mount St. Helens. Of course, below us, as I said, is the Columbia River. And coming up here on our right is the Tina Bar and when I put the video together, I'm going to go ahead and freeze frame and label that so you get a better sense of where the money was found there by an eight-year-old boy in Now, as you look off the nose of the airplane, everything out in front of us, this is the area that the FBI at that time believed that uh, AKA DB Cooper jumped. And as you can see, that would that would be a foolhardy decision on the part of an experienced paratrooper. Ariel's gonna be right at the mouth there of Lake Merwin. There's the Lake Merwin Dam. And the terrain gets more and more inhospitable as we continue. You can see why they believe he didn't survive the jump, but the problem is that uh, this isn't where he jumped. 3.6 nautical miles, 2 minutes, 15 seconds. And Ariel's right on the Lewis River here, where it comes off of Lake Merwin at the dam. After chasing thousands of leads over more than four decades, the FBI finally closed its D.B. Cooper case in 2016 without a resolution. 
As I said during this video, I highly recommend that you watch Dan Grider's video entitled Deep Family Secrets. I'm convinced that you'll come away from that believing that he correctly identified the real D.B. Cooper. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again next time.